Well, hello, everybody, and good afternoon from sunny Scotland. Uh, and I really mean it. It is actually sunny and warm in Scotland today, which is a very rare occurrence. So we get to say it with a smile. Um, hi, my name's Saul. I look after sales and marketing at Synaptic. And uh, we wanted to welcome you to another one in the series that we host of uh, webinars looking at uh, particular aspects of distributed sensing and condition monitoring. Thank you all for joining. A lot of you have turned up on time, which we always greatly appreciate. But as you all know, we're all living in this uh, kind of COVID world where we're going back to back online meetings and team and Zoom meetings. So we like to give everyone a few minutes to settle in and catch up and join the meeting as they're scrambling from one to another. While we do that, uh, let me give you a couple of housekeeping notes. So we have some guest panelists and speakers today and some polls to share with you to collect everyone's opinions about monitoring uh, overhead lines. While we do this, please note that we are recording the session and the people who have registered and who were able to participate with us will be able to access that on a private YouTube channel that will play back to you a few days after the session. Additionally, there's information on our website, which is synaptic with the dot between the T and the E on a lot of these subjects and others that we cover in this series of webinars. If you've missed out or you wanted to know more, you're welcome to come and ask any of us afterwards. We'll share our contact details as we go through this. You will also note that uh, we've got uh, various options when we play with Zoom, such as Q&A and polls and chat. The chat is not enabled in these sessions and audience members are on mute. We've got a Q&A session where we can take live questions. So as we go through this stuff, very often customers and people who are interested in their subjects matter We'll try to ask questions to contribute to the conversation or maybe we've overlooked something. We'll do our very best to try and scan those and bring those up in the conversation or we'll catch them at the end. However, if we don't get to it, our apologies, that does happen, especially when people get very deep and technical on us and get very into how this stuff works. That's okay. We always respond to these and keep a recording of them. So if you don't get an answer during the session, don't be shy about it. Please keep the questions going. We will respond to you. We'll just do it directly offline after the session is completed. Okay, so with that in mind, um, Neil, if you could help me out by moving the slides along. So today we're talking about overhead line monitoring, forgive the acronyms, but this is an growing part of our business. And we've noticed as well that there are people interested, not only in our customers, but also other technology providers in this space including uh, Ampassimon, and we're delighted to have Rena from Ampassimon along with us today to join in and offer some thoughts and case studies and customer experience with us. We've also got Chris Conway as a, a guest panelist who's uh, come to us as an expert with decades of experience in underground cable monitoring and uh, HV condition monitoring from his days at the Schlumberger uh, business. Uh, additionally, our John, who is the business development lead for HV Grids, and Neil, who is our lead engineer on everything to do with hardware systems and sensors. Uh, so those are the people that are you'll be hearing from or seeing during this presentation. Neil, if you could just click along. Uh, we'll leave this up deliberately in the recording afterwards in case anyone's got any questions about our guest presenters. But uh, let me start this one off um, by giving everybody a quick overview because sometimes people join us because of the subject matter without necessarily knowing who we are and what we do and therefore how this plays into overhead line monitoring. So just as a quick framing point, Synaptic invented a technology which allows us to reach out very long distances over a wide area and synchronously measure multiple locations across different parameters. And fundamentally, what we invented and patented is a technology which allows us passively to measure current or voltage in multiple locations. And it's all connected back to a central interrogation unit through optical fiber, which is available in most transmission networks. And this allows us to measure things like voltage, current, but also temperature, vibration and strain. And although the key uh, development focus of Neil's team and our engineers at Synaptic was to optimize current and voltage measurements, which is our unique technology. And that's very important for protection purposes, uh, doing things like digital substations or instrumenting and providing unit protection schemes for very complex circuits with multiple branches or sections or overhead and underground elements, as you can see here. 
we've also realized that a lot of the demand coming to us is not about protection at all and not really heavily focused or that relates to electrical parameters. There's equal interest in looking at the overhead lines, uh, places which are very remote or inaccessible, where it's very difficult to have any powered instrumentation today. And because our technology is fundamentally passive and we can see things live from a great distance away, there's value in being able to combine our technology along with others like that of Ampassimon, who are using 4G Internet of Things networks to bring signals back when there's no 4G, when it's underground or subsea, we are a very good additional or complementary technology to that mobile phone network or cellular coverage. So Neil, if you click on the next thing, I apologize for showing everything here, but today we're really focusing on the area of wide area monitoring. And we're not talking about uh, phaser measurement and synchrophasers, although that's our core business. Uh, this is about the fact that we can, as I say, go out over long distances and look at overhead spans, monitoring for combinations of factors like sag and strain, vibration, temperature, and getting very targeted and specific measurements of individual spans, always looking for some kind of early warning of a failure. I think that's the key to this. We're able to bring live and then stored and built up analytics to show this. So uh, this brings us really on to the main theme for the day on the next slide, which is, okay, well, why should everyone monitor overhead lines? And at this point, um, I'm going to invite Rena and Chris to speak to this. But what we've noticed, at least in our experience, is that there is a combination of factors. It's never one single thing. What we've heard about so far, to give everyone an example, is um, okay, ice accretion. So is there an overhead line in a cold area where the ice could build up and simply weigh heavily down on the conductor and effectively bring the low point of the line down to a dangerous height where there's not enough clearance and there's possibly a clearance problem or a safety violation to be concerned about. This could equally apply, and while we've got it as a second bullet here, when you're talking about these lines which are reaching down and they could be dangerously low because they're in a uh, high density urban area with high contact risk to the public or presents a safety risk, or perhaps if it's close to something else that it could touch down on. So those are the obvious ones, but we're also uh, finding that there's a lot of interest in understanding ampacity, which is calculating you know, the thermal capacity of a conductor in specific places and identifying bottlenecks in that thermal capacity, not just on one piece of line, but across the whole system, which could even go back into the substation and include transformers and other devices, which are systemic, systemically part of the whole where, where there could be bottlenecks uh, to optimize the availability or the efficiency of the whole system. However, uh, we've also noticed uh, their interest in fatigue such as wind-induced vibration and galloping effects, which could then uh, create a structural failure. And early warning of that is very useful. Uh, this comes from at least two operators that I know of who today are trying to spot these failure points with thermal imaging cameras on helicopters. And that's relatively expensive and inefficient because you don't monitor all the critical points all of the time. It's quite rare in the periodicity and frequency between visits and inspections manually. So if you can see these hot spots occurring, which are the result of the conductor thinning and then breaking just next to the bushings, that could be a very useful and again, automated condition monitoring tool. And perhaps one of the latest ones here is uh, high temperature and low sag uh, conductors. Uh, we've got customers now who are asking us to perform benchmarking operations as they're trialing new composite materials technology to distinguish how much more thermally efficient and capacitive these lines are, which with the new materials, as opposed to the old standard helically wound steel cables, for example. Um, now, that could be quite a niche activity, but we're certainly being asked to provide some kind of benchmarking of the new version to the old version of overhead line conductors. Um, that said, Rena and Chris, um, maybe you've got an opinion on any one of these being particularly or obviously more important to the industry that's happening out there now. Um, perhaps, Rena, if, have you got a comment on what the key uh, overhead line monitoring requirements actually are here? Is one standing out more than the others for you? Um, the, 
Well, I would short answer yes. <laughs> and, and I would say that one is the, the opacity in the middle. Um, and the reason why I say that is because um, at least with Ampassimon, right, uh, uh, the main business, I guess, driver for, for demand for monitoring has been really monitoring the, the, the capacity of the transmission lines. And that's our experience so far. Um, the other aspects are also uh, requested well, by various um, customers, but the one that has the most traction, I'd say, uh, globally speaking, is is really the opacity and uh, the thermal capacity of the transmission lines. That's okay, that's really interesting. Well, well, I'm going to expand that out to everyone who's in the audience here. So, if you all don't mind, I'm going to launch a quick poll here and just take a a quick kind of temperature reading from everyone who's participating here. We'd love you to have a quick read through of those options and just give us a notion of what you consider to be the most important measure ands here when you're addressing those overhead lines. I'll just give that a minute for the votes to roll in because it sometimes changes as people grapple with this and get to the keyboard. And then I'll stop the polling in a second to give everyone a quick read back of that. Okay, I think that's most of the votes come in already and it's not changing a lot. So I'll stop just there um, and then I'll share those results. Uh, Rena will be delighted to know that the world agrees with her. <laughs> and when you look at these results, uh, ampacity and bottlenecking clearly stands out at 64% as being the primary thing. Uh, to me, the interesting part is that the next one after that kind of drops off of a cliff face because then we've got safety violations and measuring the change in vertical ground clearance as the next, but only 16% by comparison, then fatigue and structural failure indicators, uh, followed by ice accretion as last. And now that just could just could perhaps because a lot of the people attending today are not in very cold mountainous regions, or indeed not in the US where I know HTLS is getting a lot of traction and people are trialing those new uh, conductors right now. So that's really interesting. Thank you for sharing that with us. It's good to validate that. So with that in mind, and knowing that it's not just mechanical, but it's mechanical and electrical sensing to derive opacity, which is important. Let me just stop sharing that. And what I'm going to ask Neil to do is just push ahead with a couple of graphics to illustrate what our approach is to this subject. And then uh, we'll ask and pass him on to give us a quick overview of their technology as well, so that people can appreciate what the potential applications and reach is in these systems. Sure, thank you, Sal. So um, this is just a kind of overview and example system, which kind of shows some of the various uh, systems that we can deploy, really. So what Synaptic offers, which is, I would say, quite distinct, but also complementary, to uh, what Ampacity, uh, sorry, Ampassimon offers, as Rena will tell us soon, um, is what we offer is a suite of completely passive point sensors for electrical and for mechanical measurements. So each one of these schemes, like you can see on the screen just now, has a single powered device, which is the interrogator. Uh, typically that's installed in a substation environment, and that's the only uh, device in the network that requires power and time synchronization. So that's only at that one central point. All the sensors outside that point are completely electrically passive and don't require time synchronization or active electronics at that measurement location. So the interrogator leverages the existing single mode fiber in the network, like you might find in the optical ground wire, the OPGW, uh, to reach out over a very long distance and connect to a series of sensors which measure electrical parameters like voltage and current and mechanical parameters like strain or sag or vibration or temperature. So as I've said, each of these sensors is completely passive. So there's no none of that kind of infrastructure at the measurement location that you would ordinarily associate, particularly with electrical measurements in the power sector. And it really takes away the, the burden of installing these sensors out in the field at remote locations. Um, in particular, this is useful if you're in a kind of a, a black spot or a remote location where 4G is not an option. And then you have this direct fiber connection, which allows you to reach out and really gather in those measurements from a wide area. Uh, it's worth saying as well that that system is very scalable. So one of these interrogators can typically support up to about 30 sensors over a distance of about 60 kilometers. So even if there's 
local 4G adjacent to the substation, if you need to reach out to a, a critical span that's in a particularly remote location, that can be done with this system. So this next slide is really just in a bit more detail, looking into what some of those uh, passive point sensors look like. So the one you can see in the top right here is just an, an example of one of them. This is the, uh, the direct measurement of SAG on the conductor. So what this actually measures is it provides a, a very accurate and direct measurement of the, uh, the strain on the conductor from which the, the actual SAG of that line can be inferred. So as you can see from the sensor design here, it's essentially a couple of mechanical clamps which affix it onto the line. And then there's the optical sensor which sits in between and then routes back to the interrogator. Um, so you're probably wondering how we get that fiber up to the live conductor. Uh, that's certainly what I'd be wondering at this point. And the way that's done, as I've said, is from the interrogator out to the measurement location or in that vicinity, we can use the existing fiber in the network. And then at a convenient splice box, we tend to work with uh, retrofit companies like AFL, who their, their main business is in routing fiber onto the, uh, the ground wire or onto one of the phase conductors and wrapping around the fiber. So they have uh, very well tested and widely deployed solutions for routing that fiber from the local splice box through an insulating element and then onto the conductor. And at that point, we can splice in our sensors. Um, each of these sensors then connects from that point in series. So from one jump onto the live conductor, you can then install multiple measurements before you have to come back down again. So that's how that fiber is routed up to those sensors. And then we have these various different sensors for electrical parameters and mechanical parameters that can be slotted in along that overhead line. So you can see some kind of various specs down here. So I've said really what, we, what you're getting is real time temperature, strain, vibration and sag. There's no, no appreciable latency associated with these measurements. You're looking at analog measurements of light in the fiber. So really the speed of light is the only limitation on the latency there. Um, in particular, because we know the speed of light in the fiber, it's very easy to time correlate measurements of electrical and mechanical parameters. So if you're looking at things like ampacity or other, uh, other effects which might require like dynamic line rating, then it's very, very straightforward to correlate those measurements from the mechanical and electrical domains with this system. Uh, the sensors themselves are designed for a very wide kind of range of operating environments. So the temperature range in particular is very wide. Um, as I've said, there's no power, no data, no 4G at these locations. So they're, they're quite scalable and quite simple to install. And they're, they're really designed for these remote locations where you can't reach with 4G. Um, finally, I would just say that because you don't have these supporting infrastructures, nor do you have things like batteries at the installation locations, they're really maintenance free. So you're installing these and then leaving them they're, They remain calibrated and they, they don't require repeated inspections or maintenance to keep them operating over several years. So really the system is designed to give you that permanent and synchronous monitoring that hopefully can be used to tackle these issues that we discussed in the last poll. So I'll hand back to uh, Rina, I think now, to just talk about how Ampassamon tackles this issue as well. Yep, thank you. Ah, good, thanks for that. Yep, um, so Ampassamon, um, it's, it's been in the business no, of overhead line monitoring for over 10 years now. Uh, we started in Belgium, but by now we have installations in more than 15 countries around the globe. And today you know, we are monitoring live 100 uh, overhead lines with around 500 sensors. And our key references are with um, companies like Elia, the transmission system operating in Belgium, RTE in France, Stutnet, Norway, um, PPL in the US and so on. And we're recently gaining more traction also in Asia with installations in, in Japan, India and Vietnam. Um, so through this experience, yeah, grid, what we've realized is that Grid owners and operators, they monitor overhead lines with sensors for mainly two reasons. We, we just had a poll before, so that you saw one of the main reasons. And the second one, uh, in fact, I thought it was accurate. <laughs> the second one is the risk, be able to monitor and ass assess the risk to safety. Um, so these are two primary uh, reasons, right? And to optimize the um, operation so that you, have, you can operate your assets closer to the limits. These are the two primary reasons. And so Ampassamon's approach is um, 
catered for, for, for this need from the, from the customer. And we support the customer in the optimal design of a monitoring system based on these targeted applications. And that's what you see here in a, in a broad uh, three-step sort of approach. And first of all, we advise on where to install like a minimal amount of sensors essentially that deliver adequate monitoring for the acceptable level of safety risk. And we do this by uh, typically historical weather data analysis or weather uh, analysis of that location where the um, transmission line is. And we uh, take into consideration information about the asset type, the history of that asset, if there's any pre-known conditions, specific characteristics about that asset, and also an analysis of the terrain, because if there's mountains or, or uh, buildings or forests, uh, trees and things nearby, that can also uh, have an impact. And then uh, we also, uh, then we install the sensors. Well, the customer installs the sensors on the uh, locations that we advise and then agreed with. Um, and this can be done uh, on de-energized lines, of course, but also on live lines, which is the, the picture you see there with the, with the helicopter. Um, and with those sensors that are clamped on to the, um, the conductors, we collect in-field measurements of sag, wind speed, the vibration of the conductor, tension of the conductor, the current, so the electrical current is running through the conductor, and some temperature measurements. And all of this is done with the single device that you see in, in the picture there. And then uh, we use this data, we take this data, it goes through the 4G, as Neil was mentioning, uh, a mobile network, to a centralized server. And on this server is um, where we calculate with proprietary software, uh, various um, uh, indicators or, or information data that's suitable for the customer to digest. And um, this information is delivered in, in real time. And in some aspects uh, also forecast, we give visibility for dynamic line rating uh, for the SAG of the conductor and the conductor temperature, if there's a, to assess whether there's violation risk. Also, if there's any risk of ice accretion on the hope headlines. And also we are able to um, give indication of accelerated aging or the fatigue that the conductors are exposed to. And uh, all of these uh, data analyses, these different types of software algorithms that we have developed is leveraging from our extensive know-how on conductor vibration science and all of these are, are patented. And that's the kind of um, package, I guess, that we offer for overhead line monitoring. We can go to the next. next. I hand this back now to Sol. Yeah, thank you. No, that's really good, Rina. Uh, while you were talking, I just had an interesting question there from uh, somebody in the audience, which I'll just pass back here as we get into this subject, which is about uh, using narrowband Internet of Things uh, as the way forward to communicate. And I guess it's just worth saying here again that uh, the reason, you know, we're sitting here quite happily with Ampassi when you might think we're sort of competitive, but actually we didn't see it like that. So where you have 4G coverage, and communications infrastructure is available and good and it makes sense. You've clearly got a technology here which is deployable and has been deployed for years now in the field. Whereas there are areas um, in the rail industry, we're looking at things like tunnels or in the offshore wind uh, industry in renewable generation, we're looking at wind farms and cables which are under the sea and a hundred kilometers offshore. There is no 4G, there is no NBIOT. So quite a few operators have said to us, look, I don't want 4G on my network, or I don't want batteries up on the line or scavenging power somehow, or I just don't have the, the communications infrastructure to bring a signal back. That's clearly appealing to have us as a backup where it says that fiber connection means there is no data from the remote site back to the substation. Everything's in encoded light, which is effectively infallible and unhackable and uninterruptible or spoofable, which is a very important concept. So, you know, we always discuss the idea of looking at both methodologies. But that said, um, this brings me on to a question about wider adoption, because although we're relatively new to this industry, we suspected that there might be questions uh, from operators about the installation cost factors or considerations about having to schedule outages to install this stuff or that there would be some kind of reticence or conservatism around adopting these new technologies and putting anything on live phase conductors up on those lines for any period of time, um, quite apart from the issues of poor communications and inaccessibility. Now, um, 
Rena, I think I remember this correctly. This really is not a new technology, whether it's from you or anyone else. I believe you've been putting these things out in the field for what, 10 years now? Yes, that's right. So Ampassimon has been as a company for more than 10 years or 11 years to be precise. But prior to that, no, we're a spin-off of, of a university. So the product has been existing prior to that already some years. So indeed, I mean, Ampassimon alone, we've had sensors up on the lines for 15 years or something already. And if you look at other markets like in North America and the US, there, even before that, they, they had other uh, types of um, sensors on, on the overhead lines for dynamic line rating application uh, as well. So in that sense, it's it's not a new technology at all. Um, all the, what is it, this overarching, uh, you know, global energy um, watches like International Energy Agency, International Renewable Energy Agency, NSOE, these kind of entities, they all rate uh, dynamic line rating with TRL-9, this is technology readiness level, right? It's not really a fundamental uh, early innovation technology. It's a mature technology. It's been proven. And yeah, it's ready for wide scale adoption. But there we come back to this question, no? what, what is limiting that wide, uh, wide adoption? So it, we believe it's not that the technology is immature. That's not even an option here, I think. So <laughs> it would be, I'd be curious to hear the, the opinions no, of our audience indeed. Indeed. Uh, one, one, of the, uh, one of the kind of pushbacks that we've experienced, um, which I believe, yes, it was came from the UK, was that there's actually a kind of a, a, a regulatory or health and safety consideration here that says, actually, it's okay to operate a network with a probabilistic kind of model as opposed to anything deterministic. We don't need to put things on the lines to measure. But I, I suspect, like you, that that's a minority case or perhaps a one company's interpretation of the uh, entire series of uh, regulations and uh, guidance uh, given out by government or by health and safety interpretation. So um, I've got a going to push this out as a poll to everyone here. We, we've listed these six things and I guess we're interested to understand if you're seeing these limitations or you recognize one over the other as being a particularly limiting factor. So if I can launch a quick poll on these three, I'd be really, sorry, these six options, we'd be very interested, I think, to understand collectively what is preventing more, because that speaks to the industry need for us to either explain this better, uh, de-risk the trialing of it better, or simply encourage wider adoption when people become more familiar with it. So rather than prejudicing it, let me just push this to you. And please, everyone, take a moment to give us your views on any of these things. And then perhaps we can guide the conversation from there to address whatever are the most critical items appear to be. OK, I'm going to give everyone a little bit more time than that 30 seconds to answer because there's no clear winner yet and it might suddenly spring if I stop this too soon. I'm at risk of messing with the voting public and confusing everyone and giving a false read, which is something we never want to do. OK, that looks like quite a lot of you have stopped and are not answering anymore. So let me hold it there. Ooh, always happens to say it and then one more person pops in. Let me just publish that to everyone because the results are perhaps not as clear cut as we thought. So the, there's a 31% is the most popular, which is referring to installation cost, as opposed to the next down, which is a tie between the inaccessibility or remoteness of locations which maybe suffer from poor communications or access as in physical access, you know, for power supplies and data networks and equipment. Um, you can imagine mountainous regions are a typical example of that or somewhere that's way across the desert where there's simply no infrastructure available to utilize. Uh, accuracy or reliability of data ties with that. And then slightly behind that, the ability to monitor multiple locations synchronously. So, um, Rina, I'm gonna aim this at you again and very unfairly ask you to comment on that item the first one, let's look at installation costs just for a moment. Although it's unfair to ask you to just say, well, it's $100 and that's what it costs. 
when we talk about installation cost of putting something up onto a live conductor, how have you reassured or overcome those concerns and how, how much of the overall cost of doing this, does that really matter? Um, how much of the cost really matters? Yeah, I think that's the, the key point, right? So um, what, what we find is um, you, you, the customer or you know, the people that are installing it have to have uh, start the project, ideally start the project with a good understanding of what is then the expected benefits that will be delivered by installing this system, right? And that way you can put it on the scale, essentially, uh, the expected benefits versus the, the costs. Yeah? And um, particularly when it comes to dynamic line rating, I hope I have a chance to explain a bit more later, um, that the, the potential benefits from this avoided costs of congestion management is really quite large. And so there, when you put it into perspective, the installation cost is really comes out quite as the fraction of the benefit that you could tap into. Um, Having said that, um, yeah, it, it, it can, if, depending on the application, right? Uh, if it's not uh, increased grid capacity, that's your targeted application and your application is uh, safety. I mean, that's, how do you put a price tag on that in terms of benefits? If you can safeguard public safety, your asset safety, um, and uh, yeah, mitigate uh, catastrophic essentially uh, circumstances, then really the installation costs, it's quite obvious, I think, the, the value for, for the, the money, so to say. That would be my perspective. Thank you for that, Rina. Um, now, while you were just there, um, there are a couple of questions that uh, came up uh, that are probably worth uh, playing back to the group because one of these, I must admit, I don't have a good feeling for, but one of the panelists might. So one of the questions was asking uh, about line atmospheric discharge location detection or monitoring. Um, I didn't have that as any one of the major factors that would drive trialing or using this technology. And I confess I'm not actually uh, expert enough to say that I understand what the use case is. But uh, Rena or Chris, have you ever come across the requirement to monitor line atmospheric discharge? Yeah. I'm assuming that this is talking about corona discharge. Um, so there may be, I think that's a topic really that we probably need to, to answer um, directly online and find out more about what the uh, uh, what the specific issue uh, is. Um, I think it would be interesting to look at it in terms of um, of, of, of current, uh, of, of possibly power quality, uh, to see if there's some signature uh, that can like, be uh, achieved to detect such events. Um, so I think it, re it requires probably a little bit more digging, uh, but I'm sure you know, we need to probably um, yeah, to expand on that, but you know, I, th I think that there, th that's where I think that that issue is uh, pointing at. Got it. Thank you for that. Um, so, with that thought in mind, um, the next part of this session that we wanted to move people on to was that, as suspected, we've got an interest primarily in ampacity, where you need to combine both the physical attributes of things like sag on the line and temperature and wind speed along with also the current because you need both to, to, to get to that ampacity rating. We also wanted to talk an, a little bit more about ampacity and then stepping beyond that onto dynamic line rating. So Neil, if you want to just uh, shove these forward another slide again. Um, Rina kindly provided us with a case study uh, from Ampassimon's experience that's talking about why dynamic line rating, which is of course more about forecasting into the immediate future based on ampacity, uh, is actually becoming uh, more and more useful. Uh, so Rina, could you quickly uh, take us through, you've got these two slides here on your case study so that the, everyone here can get a, a feel for the challenges and benefits of what you're able to achieve. Sure, thanks. So 
Here you have a very interesting chart, right? I hope you can, you don't have to read all the fine uh, print, but I'll go, I'll try to run you through it. <laughs> so um, yeah, this, this thermal rating of transmission lines, it's, it's seen as a bottleneck to access faster these benefits right, of renewables integration and market efficiencies. And many governments, everybody recognizes, uh, are pushing now for policies and rules that call on transmission and distribution system operators to, to change the way they manage the grids and tap into flexibilities, right? And as a consequence, this is what you see here. As a consequence, we have very complex processes. These are developed by engineers. Yeah? And here you see the business process mapping against the timeline. At the top, you see the timeline where it says uh, day D, which is today, and day D minus one, which is the day before. So uh, one day ahead, so a forecasting sort of uh, time domain. And um, here, you, you, this timeline, um, you, you have to coordinate, right? The amount of uh, grid capacity um, that can be safely allocated for the power markets trading and the amount of congestion that might result and that needs to be managed by things like redispatching, counter trading, and curtailing renewables or activation of demand response. And these things will uh, help you avoid an overloading situation of the, of the power grid assets. Yeah, so you see very clearly that the steps, A, B, C, everything interrelates and then, okay, obviously not. It's not very simple to follow, right? So let's go to the next slide. I tried to simplify this for everybody <laughs> because it's a very complicated uh, diagram. Here it's a little bit more straightforward, I think. Uh, basically, the processes start two days ahead of real time. Uh, and uh, here, the grid capacities that can be used for the day ahead market trading, electricity trading day ahead market, this is calculated based on forecasted power flows and the thermal rating violation risk. And uh, as you know, forecasts become more accurate the closer to the real time you get. So to refine this process and to gain more certainty, the process is repeated with updated forecast values, mm -hmm. then one day ahead of real time, and then in the, the actual day and so on. And so here, the grid capacities um, for the intraday trading is calculated, and but also the ex expected congestion for the next day is calculated by performing what's called contingency analysis, right? And this is the operational security analysis in the graph there. Um, and so the expected power flows and the resulting overload risks for the next day is assessed based on forecast values again. And this is then repeated in the intraday timeframe, which then triggers congestion management actions like redispatching, counter trading, curtailment of renewables. And all of these congestion management actions cost money. You have to pay for that action. And so then the final step, what we've written here is CRT is close to real time, like two hours before real time. And this is uh, here the options that you have to get rid of uh, a critical um, uh, risk or safety, sorry, safety violation risk. Here are uh, last resort actions uh, that grid operators might have. Um, and, and these can be temporary opening and closing of switches to divert uh, power flow from one circuit to another or asking or almost immediately controlling generators or demand blocks to, to switch off, um, disconnect um, and, and to activate that very quickly. Or in the worst case, really to switch off uh, customers, so load chain. So you don't want to get uh, to, the, to the last step. You want to have uh, adequate measures in place ahead of real time. And that's why forecasting is really important. So my point here is that um, in any of these steps, right, uh, the forecast, not only the forecast power flows, but the forecast rating, the thermal rating is also required. The forecast dynamic line rating is required to tap into this flexibility of the grids. And this is why we are providing this forecast DLR at different timeframes that are indicated there on the bottom for, for the day ahead timeframe. There's uh, available, made available 48 to 60 hour ahead forecast dynamic line ratings for the day ahead calculation processes this 24 hour ahead forecast for dynamic line rating for the intraday processes a few hours ahead and so on. And then um, we come back here to the, to the case, not case studies, but examples, I guess, of um, how this was tangibly um, put in practice, I suppose. 
by our customers. And um, here, the, the real life impact is what you see above, you know, in the little bubbles. Um, here, um, for example, in the two, day ahead, two days ahead time frame, uh, the uh, transmission system operator in Belgium called Elia, they use this uh, two day ahead or 60 to 48 to 60 hour ahead dynamic line rating information in their calculation processes. And by doing that, they were able to derive a quarter of a million, close to a quarter of a million euro savings in a matter of four hours. And the, the, how they did this was to increase the capacity of trading between its neighboring country to import cheaper electricity. And with a short amount of time, even, sorry, there's somebody entering. Sorry for the interruption, there's somebody coming in the room. <laughs> um, yeah, this, this, this kind of um, benefit, uh, especially on areas where there's a, a huge price divergence between two regions, can be achieved in a very short amount of time, even with a modest capacity increase of 10 to 20%. So this is very um, interesting in areas where you have, uh, yeah, the, the, the uh, opportunity to tap into the, the dynamics, I suppose, of different markets and prices. And then the next example there, we go to the intraday part. And here again, uh, it's an example from Belgium. And here, uh, what they have told us is that uh, in a single day, because in Belgium, they're in the middle of crossroads between uh, Germany, uh, Netherlands and France, and also Germany and then UK also, yeah, they have a lot of transit flows and to get rid of uh, potential overloading situations caused by these transit flows, they need to call for uh, redispatch and counter trading uh, congestion management measures. And these are very expensive, perhaps, uh, yeah, 500 euros per kilowatt hour type of, um, uh, sorry, megawatt hour, 500 euros per megawatt hour type of uh, <laughs> uh, cost, uh, costly measures. And so, um, yeah, they, they have uh, in, in very critical times used the capacity uh, available, made available from the forecast dynamic line rating in an intraday timeframe to not have to activate these anymore and thereby saving close to half a million euros of congestion management costs in a single day. And this they see not only once in the last 10 years, they see this regularly in a period of uh, three months last year. They saw that, uh, I don't know, uh, so many times that they don't even bother to calculate it anymore. This is, this is quote unquote what they say. So yeah, it, it's, it's very clear to us that uh, forecast dynamic line rating is, is where the highest potential for the monetary benefits is. And this is why we strive to deliver the, the best in class dynamic line rating for our customers. Um, I hope that explained a little bit uh, in detail um, how dynamic line rating, for forecast dynamic line rating is used in these kind of processes. It does make it's, it's, it's good to put real numbers on this too. Uh, it's fascinating. Um, Chris, sorry, did I interrupt you then? I don't know if you were going to call. No, this, no, okay. <laughs> All right, thank you. Uh, well, the, the, this also raises some questions uh, that may come up. So uh, Neil, if you just push on to the next slide. Um, we were talking earlier on about ampacity, you know, that along with other kind of uh, emergency alarms that we can provide would certainly help with improved decision-making in the control room and dispatch decisions. But uh, that often requires a lot of coaching and education and confidence building over a long time uh, before anything's actually actively done to change those behaviors and management patterns. However, I think what I heard from you, Rena, is that basically the, the forecasting element, whether it's immediate or just you know, even 48 hours out, is really about uh, maximizing the potential capacity of a system so that either you're not having to build new infrastructure to cope with demand because peaks can be met with the latent or inherent uh, spare infrastructure that's there. It's just a question of doing it safely, or it's about actually making the entire model more deterministic and less based on things like 
uh, non-specific weather forecasts, which are probably not precise enough for individual locations to rely on totally or just wrong <laughs> so much of the time. So bringing, uh, bringing all of these systems into a more deterministic world where you've got higher confidence to make decisions and then being able to dynamically rate things is certainly going to be good. Um, I think that was clear. The other one I just wanted to ask everyone about was um, that there seems to be a role for this in DER integration um, and one I hadn't thought about, which is the optimization of scheduled maintenance. Could you just talk about the DER aspect a little bit for us? Because that was sort of like a different angle on things that I hadn't considered before. Uh, so that's for me. Okay. Yes, please. <laughs> okay. Um, so, well, with DER, I guess um, the, the primary example is renewables, right? Because renewables tend to be distributed. Um, and uh, I think also for, for European, UK sort of geographies, wind energies is, is um, the, the most the one with the most potential, the one that you most often encounter. And there, of course, with dynamic line rating, it's very interesting because when you have strong winds, you have a high amount of power generated by the wind farms, which then injects into the, to the power grid and start to cause high power flows. And then at the same moment, the wind cools the transmission lines or the distribution lines and it releases that extra capacity. So the, the correlation is really good, right? Um, and so this is why it, it really is a, a, almost a no-brainer solution, especially when it comes to wind power integration, to, to pair it with dynamic line rating. Yeah, I had that, that, that's such a good explanation. It just suddenly makes sense that what you're saying is when the wind's blowing, there's more power being generated, but more capacity to bring it online <laughs> for the same reason. Okay, that makes sense. I think I understand now. And then um, maybe... Uh, at that point, I should also ask everyone else to have a vote on this as well. So we're going to ask everyone to do one last quick poll here because we're very interested to know how you rate the relative benefits of dynamic line rating uh, in terms of what's most important to everyone out there. So if you wouldn't mind, uh, I appreciate that we've probably framed this a bit tight, but if you've got opinions about what matters here between either that immediate control, DER sort of maximization and output uh, optimization as opposed to that kind of standard one of, okay, you can release more capacity safely to avoid building new figures in the first place. Uh, I think that would be really interesting to understand where everyone's opinions are, are lying. Now, while that's coming in, um, okay, there's one or two more questions as well that we'll have to capture here, but let's just see how this poll finishes up once enough of you have voted and the majority of people have had their say. Again, I don't want to close things off too much, but we've just got enough time to keep talking for a few minutes here to the end of the session uh, to see what these results are telling us. And that looks like a healthy majority coming through. Okay, I'll stop there and share these with you. So um, in terms of who, what you think are the most useful benefits, the most popular answer, only 40% of the total though is improved control room decision making, uh, which is very closely followed by uh, what I was describing as you know, using uh, safely the potential thermal capacity that's there in existing feeders so you haven't got to build a new infrastructure. So you're squeezing more value out of the infrastructure that's already available to you for short periods of time. And then that drops down to the idea of having some more deterministic and higher confidence factors in your forecasting, as opposed to the perhaps relatively minor ones uh, here of DER integration, optimization of scheduled maintenance. So the DER one, Rena has explained is clear, and it could be that that's lower in this audience because we have quite an international mix attending our sessions and perhaps that renewables integration is just less pronounced for some operators and in some countries, of course, you know, wind is a big thing in the UK and it's not a big thing in other countries like South Korea, uh, to pick a random example of a developed country, which is almost entirely nuclear uh, in generation. Um, the other one that was relatively low here that we didn't discuss though was uh, optimization of scheduled maintenance. So um, my understanding of, of that is to say that again, if you know that the load can be shared presumably across other feeders, then uh, you are presumably able to uh, plan and schedule better 
uh, out, outages to do repairs and upgrades on feeders because the strain can be taken elsewhere. Is, is that essentially the idea, Rina? I think it was. Yes, that's right. So it gives you more flexibility then to right to secure uh, the outage, maintenance outage in the time that you want, more or less. Yeah. Okay. So, um, and then one, one last kind of comment from me linking back this one to the question about why wider adoption isn't here just yet, even though this is quite a mature technology, uh, might be in that the most popular response here, just edges it though, is on con improved control and decision making. I suspect that there might be uh, gradual adoption of putting these devices online to do the monitoring, but an even slower adoption curve in how that data is taken with high confidence in the control room where dispatchers actually act upon it with confidence. That's probably a whole culture change and familiarity that needs to be developed over a period of quarters and years to, to build up the confidence to make decisions based on this data. So I think I can understand the correlation between those two results. It's not reticence, it's just experience saying, well, let's see how good it is and give it time and going through all different seasons and load scenarios to really understand how it can be used and how confident you can be on the results that you're seeing. And I think everyone can appreciate the need to be cautious and get that right. Okay, uh, let me just stop that polling and sharing there. Thank you very much for that, everybody. Um, one other question that I just wanted to pop in here because I think we're just at the end of our time and also the content that we presented here. Um, Neil, if you want to click on that last slide, just so people know whose names are whose. Uh, again, if there are questions coming up afterwards uh, that Neil can help you with in terms of sensor technologies, Chris can help you with in terms of industry trends on condition monitoring and asset management. Uh, Rena can help with everything which is NBIOT and 4G based in terms of line ratings and then, sorry, uh, and the systems and algorithms that are required to do the forecasting for line ratings, um, then please do ask us. In the meantime, there's one other question that came in that might be worth just ticking off because we were able to answer a lot of them live. Um, there was a question about uh, electrical fault recorders having similar problems. Oh, sorry. Can things like electrical fault recorders solve similar problems? Uh, have any of you got an opinion on that? Because I'm, I don't think I'm the right person to answer. Maybe I can chime in there a bit. Um, so what's important with, at least with dynamic line reading, right, is really an understanding of the weather and the cooling, uh, in, uh, environmental cooling of the overhead conductor. So a fault recorder, which is uh, very uh, focused on measuring with high accuracy the electrical characteristics, I suppose, um, has some information, part of the information, because heat is generated by current in the line, right? But it, it doesn't really deliver the same accurate visibility about the cooling effect of the air temperature around or the wind, right, that's blowing on the line. So there will be a, a, a gap probably that has to be filled, perhaps by complementary instrumentation um, or, yeah, some other data provider, I imagine. Okay. Um, and uh, Neil, I think I've got one for you here, which is a really nasty one. But since we've got a couple of minutes left at the end here, I, I thought you'd give you the chance to address it. So there's uh, one of the audience here saying, could you give us some information about the packaging of these FPG based sensors that's, that we use at Synaptic and the interrogator in terms of the durability and life or productive and accurate lifespan that's expected of the sensors and interrogators in these systems? Sure, of course. Um, so all of the sensors that we uh, that we design for this sort of environment, they're designed for this sort of industrial application. So in terms of their uh, their encapsulation, their packaging, and in terms of their temperature range and the calibrations that we perform to ensure that they operate correctly over that temperature range. Um, so that all feeds into how long they will perform at a given accuracy. So what we also do with these sensors is run accelerated lifetime programs in-house so that involves temperature cycling and um, driving them at a higher oscillation a higher vibration rate than they would experience out in the field uh, in normal operation to really accelerate that degradation and what we've seen from that is a general lifetime uh, in excess of I think about 140 years equivalent lifetime 
in terms of if you accelerate uh, the, if you put them in an extreme environment to accelerate that degradation, that's the amount of time it takes to really break down the performance of these sensors. So we're very confident in the kind of fit and forget lifetime performance of these things. Hopefully that answers the question, so. Yeah, brilliantly. Um, 140 years is mind-bogglingly good. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay. Um, now, um, there is another one here that I, I, I want to uh, get to you while everyone's still on the session. And then I think that'll be the last one today because we don't want to over overrun and outstay our welcome. People have kindly given us their time today. If I haven't responded to you live in this session, don't worry, we're recording all of the Q&A and we will follow up with you and respond. Uh, because I know some of these ones I can see already are a bit too detailed to take time up here. Uh, but there's one more for Ampassimon, Rina. Um, could you comment on the accuracy range of Ampassimon's fault detector? Does it locate where the fault is? Um, thanks, Saul, for the question. Um, but uh, we are not, uh, we don't provide fault detection for transmission lines at Ampassimon. <laughs> well, well the, the, I think the question might have yeah. been uh, maybe awkwardly phrased uh, for, uh, for our purposes, but I'll, I'll, I'll try and answer it with you this way, perhaps, yeah. just, to, just to round this off. So cl clearly for electrical faults, that's a core competency of Synaptic, right? Um, we, we provide fault detection identification, and if you measure current and voltage at both ends of a feeder, we can calculate the impedance to the fault. Uh, electrically to locate it very specifically within a span, for example. Uh, if you're talking about a fault as in a failure, as in a mechanical break of something, then certainly we've tested uh, our vibration sensors in a way where we can characterize and hear a relative amplitude of a signal to determine where that event happened. So like a sudden impulse event that would be equivalent to a fraying or fretting of a uh, helically wound steel cables or maybe a snapping of a dropper or a thinning of something, uh, some unusual uh, thermal or mechanical readouts are uh, possible because you could put some of these sensors on every span. And I think for overhead lines, it's appropriate to try and get the locational accuracy to one span. And then you've got an ability to target a team where to go uh, with good enough precision to have a look along that span and see what the problem is. But combining, I think, both of those things is probably the answer. If what you mean by the question of fault is mechanical failure or electrical fault, uh, they're two very different approaches. So um, we might have fudged that question, and I apologize if that's not what you meant. But I hope that's a satisfactory answer for now. Um, now, as I said, uh, a few other ones here that I'm afraid we can't get to, but thank you so much. So let me just stop the session there because we're just at the limit of our time today. Uh, I want to thank uh, the panelists and uh, particularly Chris and Rena for listening in and contributing uh, some questions and insights. Uh, also to everyone who attended, we will be following up with you. Uh, we've got your email addresses, of course, so we'll be able to send you access to a recording of this on a private YouTube channel afterwards. And for any other general questions that might come up or inspiration of, for future questions about how we could help you, uh, please come and talk to us. We'll have our contact details uh, on the recording here, but also we'll be in touch with you anyway. So if we can provide more specific answers to your questions about your needs, we'd be very happy to do so. And there's plenty of information on our website at Synaptic, that's S-Y-N-A-P-T dot E-C. Okay, everyone, uh, we will stop our recording and stop the session here. Thanks everyone for joining us. And then we're just gonna leave this screen open for a couple of seconds towards the end of the hour and allow people to go just so we can capture all of the rest of the Q&A traffic that's happening in the background. But thanks again, and we hope to see you next month where we'll run another one of these focusing on the monitoring of underground cable systems. Thank you. Have a great afternoon.